This is going to be a demonstration for our one color watercolor, which we see uh, shown here on the camera. Now, one of the greatest advantages that you have going into watercolor that most people don't have is that you've had some experiences in sketching and doing black and white. And you already understand your values and you understand the different uh, things that we're trying to do as far as composition and values and uh, balance and this kind of thing. Just for your information, this is a C-shaped composition. I designed this where the darks would come around here, lead your eye back up here, and then this brings your eye back into the picture and leads you to the center of interest. And it's called a C-shaped composition. Uh, now, nothing that happens in any painting that's uh, successful, it happens by accident. Now, a lot of people wonder, why do we just start with one color watercolor? Well, when I started art school, not to be critical, it's just the way it was done back then, um, I was given about 15 colors and told to paint watercolor. And we were told uh, that most instructions we got that we were going to have to do 100 uh, paintings that we threw in a trash can before we did a good one. And that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I used to think, well, if they would only show me how to do it one time, uh, I, I bet you I could learn how to do it. And so I'm, I, be, I believe very strongly in, in demonstrations based on the preliminary studies that you've done, which will almost ensure you 100% success. Uh, watercolor is a very difficult medium and psychologically it can be very devastating. Conversely, by doing the first one and doing it successfully, it really does encourage you to go on. So that's the reason that uh, I go ahead and, and, and do this particular one. Now, and the way that I do it. Uh, a few things that I'll mention relative to the equipment that you've gotten uh, with this. The first thing is, let's see if I can put uh, something white here to illustrate it. This is a number eight brush. It's a, uh, it's no, specifically known as a number eight round. Now, years ago, I used nothing but sable brushes like everyone else. They were handmade brushes and so forth. Uh, brushes today are all synthetically made. The handmade uh, animal hair brushes are so expensive and there's very few people that even make them now. So uh, this is what we're using. And that's the reason we're using now using it. Another reason I'm going to have you do the entire thing with one brush is that you'll have a tendency to want to do um, your watercolor with your painting with the tiniest brush you can get because of a lack of confidence. And if you read any good watercolor book, they're going to tell you, use the largest brush possible for your broad areas and then bring it down smaller and smaller for detail. And this is basically what I want to teach you is that you can do this entire painting with one uh, brush and it doesn't have to be that uh, uh, detailed and whatever, and yet you can, do, you can get very good detail with it. Now, the watercolor that I normally use is Burn Umber. And uh, I use the Holbein watercolors. There's two brands that I can recommend. One is either Holbein, which is a Japanese-made color. The other one is uh, Wins and Newton, and, uh, which you're probably familiar with. Now, uh, these are both professional-grade colors, and I, I use the Holbein if possible. Uh, but uh, the Wins and Newton is a good professional color. I just prefer the whole vine. I, I feel the colors, some of the colors have a little bit more intensity, particularly the umbers. Now, um, but regardless, what is it that makes a professional color? A professional watercolor, like anything else you do, depends on three things. It depends on the quality of the pigment. If you use a cheaper pigment, it fades. Okay, so the first ingredient in professional quality is a, a watercolor that's going to be permanent. And that's why the Winsor Newton, not the London series, but the Artist series, professional series, is the quality series. And Holbein doesn't even make a student grade. They just make one grade of, of a professional. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's correct. So it'll confuse you when you go in the store sometime and you buy Winsor Newton. Uh, and it's not the professional grade. Because what happens, the colors fade. But secondly, uh, you don't have the density in the pigment. 
And so you'll put something on and it, and it looks like it's dark enough, but it drives 10 shades lighter. So you're only going to be as good as your equipment in watercolor. And I strongly recommend using only professional equipment. Uh, so in the ingredients in a professional watercolor is the quality of the pigment, the quantity of the pigment, and the quality of the binding medium that glues it together. You remember when you went into pastels, I showed you how all paint is made from powder and it's glued together. Well, it's the quality level that goes into this that gives it its permanence and gives it its uh, much, uh, I think, better way to use it. And, and I, st I would not go into watercolor or anything unless I was ready to use the best that you could buy because it, it will give you the results you, you're looking for. So we have a number eight brush, a professional grade watercolor, whichever brand you would buy. And then lastly, we have the watercolor paper, which we have here. It's, it's very difficult to see it on the screen, but this is a 140 pound watercolor paper. Now, this is an Arches watercolor paper. And the critical thing in watercolor paper and is the fact that you want a, a paper that is that has no acidity to it. So the first ingredient in a quality watercolor paper is that it be acid free, or what you would call a neutral pH factor. Now, the most watercolor papers, except for the synthetics, are made from 100% cotton. I like the Arches brand watercolor because it's what's known as a handmade, mold-made watercolor. Meaning that they started making this paper in the late 1400s in France and it's still made the same way, at the same mill. They, uh, they mix it by hand, they pour it in molds by hand, they compress it by hand, and then when they lift it out, they dry each sheet individually on a clothesline, but before they do, they dip it in gelatin which is a sizing. And it has a little bit of an off-white color because of that, but as a result of it, you can cut the paper with an X-Acto knife, and you can erase it to some degree, and you can do a lot to it. Uh, whereas, for instance, the Wattman watercolor paper, which is a good paper, it's machine-made, mold-made paper. It has a little bit more of a consistent linen texture, but if you put masking tape on it and lift it up or cut it with an X-Acto knife, it'll pull the paper up. So this is why I prefer the Arches handmade watercolor paper. Now the particular grade we're using now is 140 pound. That, that's only a relative term to, to designate the, the weight of it. Uh, it, it I think it goes something by the, the ream or whatever, uh, the weight of the ream. The second uh, thing is we go to after this is, a, it, and this is specifically called 140 pound cold press. Uh, you, the next size we'll use is 300 pound, okay, and that's what we use on the two color watercolor. So you don't have to remember years ago how people would wet watercolor paper yeah. and stretch it. Well, you don't have to do that when you go to the heavier paper. Now I'll use the thin paper up until about a quarter size or 12 by 16. Hold me. Then after that, I'll automatically go to the uh, to the heavier paper. Okay, so we find the three critical things, if you want to be successful in watercolor, and I know you do or you wouldn't be here, use a quality pigment, a good quality brush, and a quality paper. Okay, now, I think with, uh, with that behind us, and I might even mention in terms of the watercolor paper, you have what's known as a, a um, cold press. Uh, you have, what's, which is what we use, it's a relatively smooth paper, it's a little smoother on one side, than it is on the other. However, you can use both sides. Then there's what you call rough, which is a more naturally made paper. It's not as compressed, and it has an extremely uh, rough texture. And then you have what's known as hot press. And that's when they actually take the paper and they put it on a hot press, and it makes it almost as thin as a piece of paper. And for a long time, they of, of typing paper. For a long time, they only had the 140 pound hot press. Now they have 300. And it's very good if you're going to do wildlife or detail or something like that. It works very effectively. But that's your three main types of watercolor paper. And we'll get more into that later. But uh, as far as this part of it is concerned, any questions at all about any of it, I think it's pretty self explanatory. Okay, what we'll do then is we'll just. Uh, focus our camera on the watercolor paper. Now let's turn this over. And on this side, I actually have the scene that we're going to be doing. Now if you'll notice, um, I, took, I took quite a bit of time 
to get a very precise uh, drawing, or not maybe extremely precise, but uh, fairly precise drawing on it. wonder where the shadow was coming from. That's my water. Okay. And uh, now you, you all, a lot of people forget that you're only going to paint what's on the paper. And so many people will go into this and uh, they'll, uh, they'll not put half the drawing in or whatever and you, you can only paint what you can see and they think they're going to just figure it out later. I try to have as precise and neat a drawing as I need for the particular subject that I'm doing. Okay, now, as I was telling you about the masking tape, we'll take some of our masking tape, and the particular type we use is called Scott's number 232 drafting tape. And the number 232 is very important. I sell it here at the school, and you can also buy it at Better Art Supply Stores and Office Supply Stores in some cases. Now, what's critical is most masking tape that you buy, uh, when you... Uh, put it down and you and you push it into the paper like I'm doing. Make sure you always uh, bear down on it and really make sure it adheres to the paper. Because of it being a lesser quality glue, the water will actually go up under it. And so what you're going to find is that in what we're doing, uh, when we get through painting it and lift the tape up, it's going to be uh, very, very easy to, uh, you, to see that it leaves a sharp, crisp line. And that's the reason it cuts very well and so forth. Now, in this particular watercolor we're using the sepia uh, and it's going to give us a nice dark similar to what they did in, in their watercolor. And the first thing we want to remember is that when you go to wet something down in watercolor and you're going to do a wet on wet, you, you almost can't wait to wet the paper enough. So in this case I'm just going to take the water, just dipping it in the water. Now, of course, as you go to bigger sheets and more advanced levels of watercolor, you'll have larger brushes and whatever that make this work a lot easier. Now, in a minute, I'll put the picture back on the screen and explain what I'm doing. But if you'll notice, I'm wetting everything very thoroughly. Now, most people do not wet the paper enough. And what happens is this, this has got a sizing in it, so the first part of it that you put in there, it takes a while, but then it soaks directly into the sizing. And as a result of it, uh, leaves it where uh, it, it dries very quickly. So you almost have to wet it, let it set up, and then go back in and uh, wet it again to keep it real moist. Okay, now always look to the side check and see. So like I've got an area right here that's not wet. The glare will cause it all to look wet. However, when you look at it from different angles, you see that it, uh, it was not as wet. Now, in doing our sky, we're only going to do the top part of it, and we're going to let it gray down to where it's almost pure white. And a lot of people wonder, well, if you're going to do that, why do you wet all of it? Okay, well just like water finds its own level, paint in water or pigment finds its own level. So because of the fact that I, uh, I, I have wet this, if I was to add my sky wash, even though I might stop here and have the water come down to here, the water would continue to run until it left an edge. So you want to give the, the pigment enough to run all the way down until it dissipates itself. Now the first guy we're going to do is called wet on wet. I'm going to wet the paper down and we're going to paint it while it's very wet. And then there will be different techniques we're going to talk about as we go along, but this is how we're going to do the first part of it. Okay, now you notice, uh, let's just put this over here, there's my color. Now notice how I'll take the pigment and put it in my palette. If I want to thin the pigment, I'll add water to this, but never add water to this part. Keep your pigment as solid as you, as you can keep it, okay, and mix in the little bowls that you have there. Okay, now we never know exactly how this is going to be. That looks a little bit dark. So in that case, don't grab the paint rag and panic like so many people do.
And notice I'm going to just bring it right on down. Now remember, watercolors dry lighter. And you'll see the sky might look pretty dark right now, but it's going to be pretty close to that when we get through. Okay, now I hit that pretty well the first time I did it. Now you notice how I have the gradation coming from here to here. Now what's going to happen, this paint's going to continue to run. Now, the one thing you don't ever want to do, a lot of people will make a mistake and they'll go back in and they'll put water. It ruins it. Whatever you do, do it and leave it. Because as long as the paper is wet, you have a lot of maneuverability. If the paper starts, if you make a mistake and the paper starts drying, allow it to dry completely and then you can come back and do other things to it. Okay, now that surprises a lot of people that you can correct watercolor. Okay, now this is going to be the first part on the sky. We're going to blow dry this now and then I'm going to do the trees in the background for you. Okay? Now that we've completed this part of it, let's bring our camera in a little bit closer now and we'll do a small section on the trees and this will conclude this part of our demonstration and then what I'll do is when we get through with this I'll, as you get set up I'll come watch you do it and then we'll go to the next part of it. My opinion is uh, logically the background of Robert. Right, that's what we're going to do next. Uh -huh. And that's exactly right. The tree first. The, well, the background trees. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, I didn't make that clear. We're going to do this. Uh -huh. So you're right. That's exactly right. Now, notice we'll put this in relatively darkly. And then I'll kind of dab the People wonder what I'm doing. I'm dabbing my brush to dry it out a little bit. Now, as I come up, I want to have it darker on the base, but I want to leave a little hose for the birds to fly through. Don't make them look like that. And ma don't make these too consistent. And then if I feel like I want to come back and darken it a little bit, I can do this, you see. Now, here's something you want to remember. When you're doing watercolor, if you're right, are you right-handed? Are you right-handed? Yes. Okay. Notice I'm using the flat side of the brush, like a pencil, not the point. You see how much better it is to drag it towards me like this. You see, now if you're left-handed, you would come back and you would do it the other way. But always drag it towards you where you can watch what you're doing, you see. And I'll flip this back around like this. You notice I did one section and completed it over here, and then I'm coming back and doing another section. I've got that part of my building pretty much like I want it on my, my trees. Now, see, this hasn't dried, so before it dries, I want to come back and do this. You have to work on always if it's still yet wet. Yes, now this. Remember the background sky we called um, a wet on wet, okay? Now, don't, don't think I'm making fun with these terms, but this is called a dryly wetly, for want of a better word. <laughs> and, and the reason is that, I, you notice I put the paint on very dryly, and then I added water to it. So, for want of a better term, there's all kind of professional terms we're going to teach you that you can use to impress your friends. We have the wiggly wetly. And we just have all kinds of good professional terms like that that'll impress people. It's very impressive. Okay. Now again, I'll turn this around where... I can do this. Yeah. 
Okay, now we'll just add this like this. You've been excited about getting into this watercolor, huh? Yes. But you're moving along very quickly. Like I told you, we'll finish this in two lessons tonight and one more. goes a lot faster. I think this is when payday comes and it starts to be a lot more fun for you. Okay, now let's bring this down. We've done this entire area back here. Now let's not forget we have a little section in here. And we have a section here. Now we see this portion completed. Okay, now we're going to let it dry completely, and then on the next demonstration, I'll pull the tape up and show you what it looks like. Okay? Right. So you ready to try it? Yes. Let's do it. Now we'll go to the next uh, portion of this demonstration, and I want you to see what happens now when we pick the tape up. See how nice and crisp it leaves everything. Now this watercolor can be done a lot like a pencil study, but you have to know the stages. And that's what I'm going to teach you. And once you know that, it, it simplifies everything. Okay. First of all, we're going to cover everything with a middle tone. If y'all get in an argument, you're being recorded. <laughs> now, whenever you're doing a vertical, you always want to come back and touch it up with a horizontal. I went a little bit far over with that. <clears throat> you want to put a horizontal across the base of it to uh, settle it down. Now you notice that's one flat wash. Now remember it dries a lot lighter. And then we'll put our first... You don't have to wait for it to dry because I'm not going to touch that, you see. So we'll put our first part there. Some of this I'll tend to get a little bit loose on. I don't care if it runs a little bit or whatever. Sometimes it gives it a nice effect. We'll come over here. Well, she don't have a schedule with her now. No, I don't have it tonight. We're tentatively planning. No, it can't be that weekend. Uh-oh. It not be the night. No. Okay, this is going to be our next part.
No. Okay? Oh. And that's our second stage. Now you notice it's just a flat wash over everything. Don't worry if it's a little bit uneven. And that's the value of having your pencil sketch to really understand what you're doing. Now as we begin the next stage on the one color, I'll zoom my camera in a little bit. We're going to concentrate mainly on this uh, farm building here. Now, what you want to have is you have your middle tone and you're going to come back over with some fairly dark lines. Now, they're not going to necessarily be black, but these are 1 by 12 vertical boards. If you can flatten your brush out a little bit, it works good. If the tip on this brush, I think it's working okay now, bothers you, I'll clip it off here. Sometimes I'll have a little bit. You don't, I don't like a perfect point. I, I really want to get the flatness and I even, I even really like them worn down a little bit. All right, now notice I'm going to skip the area there for the, uh, for the post. You see, I'm going like as if there isn't even any distinction between the front or the side. when I come down here to the cistern. You know what a cistern is, right? Okay. Now notice I'm going to just make the board smaller. The reason I like to use this large brush initially, most people want to work very detailed, but you learn to paint without like you paint with a pencil. Okay, now notice now I'll go back in and I have this, the roof may be a little bit different pattern, it doesn't really matter. Because what you want to do when I do these demos, you really want to observe the picture you're working from. And you'll get the basics from it. And then, But notice how that little dry brush really brings it out very nicely. And you want to kind of put your little darker area under here. Now again, I like to layer it on, let it dry, and then come back in a moment and do the next section. Okay, now notice we've got a shadow under here, very strong here. Okay, and then I'm going to blend it out. I put my strong dark shadow. You see how easy it is just to finish one area like that. Now whatever you do in here, well, it might help if I put it on the, on the thing. Now notice I just put the shadow under here, darkened it here, and on the underside. Now if you want to uh, always remember put your little bit darker section like this right under it. Okay, we'll swing over to this side now. put our dark side in like this and you'll notice that all we've got is just a little line a few little directions here for your door the shadow on the side of your post it should still be in there you notice how I'm simplifying everything tremendously and then you might have a little bit darker area on your roof but don't lose it up against your trees you see and that's really the extent of that now it's dry enough back on the building itself to where we'll come in and we'll do just like we do on, you'll do on the three color later and even on the two color. We're going to make this slightly darker right up under it and then drag it down right up underneath the eaves or the porch area actually here drag it down. Then I might add a little bit of water 
I don't want to make it too much darker. And do that, you see. Now, again, I don't want to touch that while that's drying. So I'm going to turn it back around here. And we're going to learn how to do the famous uh, Baton Rouge Fine Arts Academy eavesdropping technique. Nobody laugh. Because uh, it's serious. See how I just made that extremely dark and these eaves will fade. And then I'll just kind of drag them down like this, you see. You see how the form begins to, to come on it. Now, while I'm waiting on this, I'll come across and I'll put my darker sections like this. Grand, now, make your little darker section along the bottom. Remember what I told you about always making these little sections like this. And you can, but a lot of people will, they'll make them different directions. You want to keep that even with the horizon like that. Okay, now that's going to pretty well conclude this portion of it, except that behind here, you do have a little tree. You notice how, what I like about this brush, it's like doing it with the pencil study. Uh, like you would do it in pencil study. You can just twist that brush, move it around, and you don't really need to suggest anything but just a few of the twigs and branches, and then you just flatten that brush out. And in one solid tone against that light sky, you want to put your tree in. and allow some of the branches to come through as you see on your picture. Now, we'll swing over here. Now, this would be a good a breaking point in terms of uh, what you were doing. Let's put the last part here for the window. We just have the doors closed. The uh, doors to the window, how, you know, how they used to have them in these little cabins. So we'll just put that up underneath there like that. Okay, now we'll lift this up a little bit and see what it looks like. And there we begin to see a little bit more of an idea of what the completed scene is going to be. Now I'm using this white like this because uh, I wanted you to be able to clearly see what I was doing on the building. Okay? Now as we go to the next portion of our demonstration here, we're going to start doing the tree. And we're going to really, I think I might put this on the television to show you how we're going to do it. We're going to really charge the brush. Uh, this is our sepia we're using here. And I'm really going to do it almost completely like it's a solid black. Now I'll come up here, I'm right at the top of the picture. Now notice I'm going to drag it down and you can really see a lot of dry brush coming out on it. Now as I drag it down, I'll bring it to the base. Almost pure pigment, I'll come over here and do the same thing. Still using the number eight brush that we started with. Now as I get to the base of it, I'm gonna take my paint and thin it a little bit. I still want it to be predominantly dark. And notice how I'm just allowing this lighter area at the base to, to come through, which will be our grass. And actually creating a grass pattern just like as if we were doing a pencil sketch. Okay, now we want to come back in. I might have actually made this tree a little bit thicker than the one that's in the demonstration, but that's all right. Now we'll come back in and do this. 
and I like to leave a few of those little white areas coming through, which you can see on there. In fact, I'll bring the camera down shortly and show you exactly what I'm talking about. Now, we'll drag this limb down, this side the same way. Now this is what you do. Okay, we're going to bring this like this. Now before, all the time, now I'm watching the drying stages. Now what you want to do is while this is drying, you have to wait till just the right point. If you do it too soon, it'll pick everything up. Now you notice how it's just at a drying stage when I can come in and do all of this extra texture. Now you may not be able to get the hang of this immediately. It takes a little while to catch on to it, but that's basically what I'm talking about. Now we'll bring the camera in a little bit closer now where you can actually see some of the textures that I have on there a little bit better. Let's just bring that in a little bit more like that. There we go. And I think you can see the scraping and all of that a lot better. Now coming back out, we'll take the camera back out again. Okay, we'll move back towards the top of the paper. Now when I start doing this foliage, I'm going to do a little bit of it, then I'll bring the camera in. Notice I'm using the flat side of the brush. And I'll actually take my brush and flatten it. Come back in. Now notice I'll have it pretty solid. And this is a, a good tree demonstration to review no matter how you do it. This is what we do as we go a little bit further along. So I'll come out like this a little bit. Now, let me bring this down and I'll focus maybe on just this one area a little bit more. Okay, now, I have a little moss coming down. First thing I'll do is drag that moss down like this. Now again, I think it creates a little bit more interest to come in and just scrape it like this a little bit. Now watch on these limbs. I'll drag this across here using the side of my brush and watch how I'll do it very much like the pencil study. I'll just do it in one stroke, twist my brush around, and for those of you looking on on the demo, this is what we do in our second series towards the end. We go into the one color watercolor. Bring this around like this. Now, looking at the picture, I have a limb that comes out this way. Then we have another little, let's see, I'll bring that down just a tiny bit. We'll have another little cluster of foliage out here. Now notice I've got very little water in my brush. Excuse me, very, yes, very little water. That's what I meant to say. Mostly pigment. And then we'll drag a little area out. And you want to just kind of loosen it up. Now notice here, kind of let it be solid, more solid towards the middle, and fade it. Now, of all the things that you're ever going to do, I think foliage is probably going to be the most discouraging. So again, flatten that brush out. Don't try to paint individual foliage. You see, now I'm beginning to get a nice flow. It's not too dark and it's not too light. And that's pretty much like what I'm looking for. Now, if you play with your brush and get it working just right, you can get some very small little limbs coming off of it like this, you see? And that's what you want to work on. That's where most people don't take their time and they lose it. And we'll make these a little bit thicker. Okay, and then we'll come back up here and just kind of finish this towards the edge of it like this. And then you notice I have another large cluster of foliage here. So again, the whole concept is to get that brush just flat like it needs to be. Watch the shapes. And notice that by how dab it, well, the way that I'm dabbing it up and down, it's going to create uneven textures, and I'll move this over just a little bit, uneven textures as well as uh, uneven strokes. Now a lot of people go to different types of brushes uh, to try to get this effect. I personally found that I can do just about whatever I want to do with one brush and sometimes I think that's better to master that. Okay, then again, this might even literally follow our painting, but I'll bring that in a little bit. 
Now, you don't see this on your actual painting, but we have a little bit more I'd like to put up here. And we'll just bring this in like this. Okay, and then we'll bring it across. And we'll come on the other side and uh, lift the paper up. Now, this is not even drawn on my paper too clearly, but I can pretty well do it from memory. As long as you understand the shapes. And you can actually bring this in and cross like this, you see. Now, this is a big help for a lot of you all that have even been doing this for a long time. Because many times we just go over these lessons and you really don't fully understand them. Okay, you see how that's working out there? Okay, now, sometimes you have to come back and darken this, but at this point, it's just about the way that I want it. And I'm going to come back in and put a few more branches coming out. Uh, you might have a little bit more moss in different places you want to put in, which you can put some in here. I think I've got some put in on this side. You notice how it just all kind of runs together. And we can scrape it a little bit like that, likewise on this one. Okay, let's lift our screen back up now. And I think we'll get a pretty good idea of what the finished uh, thing is going to look like. A little bit higher with it. Okay, now you see the entire pattern all the way across the top. And again, when I had the close-up, you notice how I had it solid and kind of fading towards the edges. And that's, uh, we'll conclude this portion of it. Now we're going down to the final phase of our one color watercolor here and of course as you can see it's got some acetate over it. Now we're down to the tree and you see this area across here, the road and the grass area over here I want to put in with uh, a flat wash first and that's what we're going to do and then uh, We'll move out from there. Now when I say a flat wash, this is what I'm referring to. I use a lot of water. And I'll just come up from the base of it like this. And that's a little bit too much water. Okay, now I'll come up. Now notice towards the base of the tree, I want to make sure there's a value distinction. Sometimes I'll even leave a little bit of the pure white. And I'll come across like this. Now I find personally when, when I'm doing things like this, now notice on your paper, everything has dimensions. It has beginnings and endings and so forth. So in this case, I'm going to come across like this. And uh, I'm going to show my lighter grass. But notice this is one flat wash. Be sure. Now notice the contrast between the road and the grass. That's why I like to do this in stages where you block in certain shapes and forms and this kind of thing. Okay, now this is this is a relatively light. Let's bring this over here just a little bit. Maybe I can bring the camera in slightly and uh, see if this will help us to pick up a little bit more of this. Now, actually, uh, looking at my original, I probably had a little bit this a little bit lighter. Sometimes you'll get it. See how that gives it a natural little flow like that. <clears throat> so the next thing is to come in now and up against the tree and the area behind it. I want to make this pretty solid. Now notice I'll come from <clears throat> the water line and I'll make my grass relatively solid here. 
and maybe block in a little bit like this, put it on the bottom. But notice again, I'm not destroying the contrast against the tree. Some of this has started to dry a little bit already, that's fine. And now I'm using almost solid pigment. Now notice how that pops up out against that road. And then in here, again, I'm just going to put enough things going on to be interesting without actually losing any of my lighter areas. Now look at how nicely that stands out against the road. All right, let's come on over to the road now. We'll just slide this over a little bit. That's completed. Now it's very important when you're thinking about the road now. We want to bring this up. Now notice how I'm starting with it relatively dark over to the opposite side. Bring it around here kind of softly, but now notice how I'm going to dry brush it and look at how I'm following that perspective. See the perspective coming around here. A lot of people just don't pay attention or they're not accustomed to it and they'll just continue to road up in any direction. And, and again, these are just little things that people do and I want to make you aware of it. Okay, we'll come up like this. Bring this across like this. Okay, now you can either wait for it to dry or while it's still wet, which is what I prefer to do many times, I'll just come by and I'll make it a little bit darker like this. So make sure whatever you do, you want to fade it. Now that little area I got up there was a little bit darker than I wanted, but that's okay. Now, that's our road. Study your drawing carefully. Now let's come across to the opposite side now. And we'll just put our grass in. Now notice again on the grass. We'll start the grass very lightly. And it may show up a little darker on your screen. But notice that light area right up against there. Okay, pulling that back up a little bit. Now, notice the perspective of the grass. As it comes closer to us like this, okay, I'm going to have it get higher. And then we'll just bring it out like this. Okay, now again, while this is still wet, I like to come up. Put my extreme darks in. Now remember, I can always come back after it dries, but I like the little uneven effect that you get. And of course, get that brush where you can make that grass stand out a little bit more. But notice now how I tapered it. See the triangular shape? And then as it gets down to the actual land itself, I'll just group all of it together. Okay, and I know on the screen it's probably, a lot of that is probably not showing up. But uh, I think you get the general idea. Now, right before it dries, I may want to come in and put a little bit darker grass. Now, let's put our post in. And a lot of times if your post is a little too dark, I'll come at it down and I'll scrape it like that. Put a post in here and another post in here. Now that's not showing up as well as it is in my painting, but again, if it doesn't show up as well as I'd like it to, you can just come back in and scrape a little area like that and it separates it. Now, 
I'm going to take the side of my brush and very carefully, now you might want to, in this background area, below the house, I did come down with this a little bit more. So notice how I'm going to, I've got my basic dark around the house, but notice how these are short strokes. They're definite. I'm going to come back about where the road ends right here to connect it across, you see. Let that follow around in the perspective. You see that little dark area right there? Make out like you don't see that because that's not supposed to be that. That was a mistake. But I'll show you how I'm getting this out. I'll show you how to pick it up in a minute. Now you notice I can come across. But see that little white area? I'm leaving there to separate it. And then at the base of my building, once I pretty well get it established, I'm going to come back and put a little bit more dark in across here. Observation, 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 take your time. Okay, then for the last part on this, let's come back over this way. You've got to get your brush. I'll do it in this light area where you can see it. Get your brush on the side, fairly small. And you get it small by the way you make the brush shape itself. And just coming across with the... the side of the brush. And kind of drag it like that to look like barbed wire. And then I just kind of broke it down here, whatever. But be real careful, it doesn't turn out to be a redwood fence. Okay. Okay, so I'll just again put my, now the whole reason for this is as your eye comes along the water, you're going to see in a moment, you want this to bring your eye back into the composition. So this is what I'm doing here. Just enough to kind of fill in this area a little bit. Okay, and that fills that in. Now this is a good breaking point. Uh, actually, as I go back here, you might want to just do this area and then the road and then this last. Now, as this dries, if I feel like I need to get it a little darker, no notice how I can come in with some individual grass and break it up. And I can also take this knife, if it's not too dry, and scrape it to get some grass effect, you see. So there's a variety of ways that you can do it, and they all work very effectively. Okay, we'll just enlarge the... Uh, screen again on this. Fill our paper up. There we go. Now you notice we have one area left here at the bottom and it's uh, going to be the water. Now a lot of people question me about this water here but really you need to understand that years ago Louisiana just had little villages and the villages went right down to the water and uh, that's pretty much how everything was laid out. Now I'm going to come across here again just, I don't wet it first. Notice how I just went right to the painting. You want it light enough to where this shows through. Okay, now, let's just lighten this slightly so you can see it a little bit better. Okay, now it kind of gives you a little bit more of the feeling of water also. Okay, now while, while it's still wet, notice I'll come right up under here and show this for the reflections of this. Kind of pick up just some massive areas here to show a few ref reflections. Uh, in here and then maybe bring this over here to show the water. Okay, likewise bring this right across the bottom. I 
I think that brings that out pretty clearly. And then uh, what we'll do is lastly, we'll come up and uh, drag this in like this. And just bring this right across. Now the last thing we want to do is just to come across, scrape a few things in like this. Okay? And that's going to conclude our painting, and in reality, this will be what the finished painting will look like with everything put together. Now, I think that leaving the sky and all off the back uh, really helped you to see it a lot more clearly as far as the interaction of everything. So that is our final stage, and uh, this is what we'll do to conclude the painting. Then I'll look at it for you, and we'll go from there.